Well, today is a day for great joy. Amen. If you've been tracking with us at Vallejo Drive over the last few weeks, we've been in this season of uh, prayer and fasting. Uh, we've been calling it the journey to the cross. Uh, seven solemn weeks of spiritual discipline. Some of us have taken that prayer and fasting very seriously and tried to intensify our relationship with God, tried to maybe uh, say no to some of those pleasures that we usually want to fill our lives with. But now we're at the end of that journey to the cross. But it's an end that signifies a new beginning. Today we celebrate Easter, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Today we proclaim with the church over the ages that Christ has conquered sin, conquered death by dying on a cross. And more importantly, that three days later, God has raised him from the dead. But I want to ask you guys, how important is resurrection to you? Do you think about the resurrection very much? Do we really need the resurrection? You know, I've even spoken to many Christians today who say to me, it doesn't really matter whether Christ actually was raised from the dead or not. As long as I'm a good person and as long as I listen to the teachings of Jesus and follow what he said, I'll be okay. Whether Jesus was literally resurrected or not, that's not a very big issue. And so I want to take as our starting point today a very important text. This is Paul talking, and this text is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as, I, as we look at this text, let's just see what Paul thought about the resurrection. He says... If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people, what does he say? Most to be pitied. You see, Paul says very emphatically, and I, I agree, that our whole entire faith rests on the truth of the resurrection. If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, he says, then you're always going to be a slave. All your addictions, all your bad habits, all of your sins, all of your guilt, your shame, your brokenness, everything, there's going to be no freedom from any of that. And worse still, he says, if there's no resurrection, Everything that you believe in is a complete joke. If there's no resurrection, everything you do is a complete lie. And if it isn't true, people ought only to feel pity for you. People should feel sorry for you. Without the belief in the resurrection, he says that everything in your life is ultimately meaningless. If this life is all that there is, your whole journey, your experiences, your memories, your, your dreams, your work, your relationships, your love for your family, all of that ultimately amounts to nothing. Now, of course, you're free to believe in the resurrection or not. That's up to you. But let's get one thing clear. Everything hinges on the resurrection. So is the resurrection difficult to fathom? Is this hard to believe? Indeed it is. And we, let's be honest, right? we generally don't see people die and then come back to life, do we? And in our very modern secular culture, most people don't believe in any miracles let alone the idea of a man being raised from the dead. So I get it. This is a belief that's difficult to swallow. And I think, and we're going to do this this morning, I think it's worth asking for a moment, are we crazy? Are we just nuts here? 
Do we have any good historical evidence for believing in the truth claim of the resurrection? How do we know that the whole thing isn't just made up? That the church just fabricated this fictitious story and then passed it on down to us? Well, just, just for fun, just for interest this morning, we're going to take a look at some of these anti-resurrection arguments. And together we'll try and see how they're not very good. They don't really work. So let's take a look at four of these anti-resurrection arguments that people pose today. The first one is what we call the argument of symbolic myth. And the first argument basically says that Jesus' resurrection is a myth. He didn't really come back to life at all, but his teachings and his cause, that's what's important. His cause lives on in our hearts. Jesus' death then is a bit like the death of uh, Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King. Um, what's important is that the things that he stood for are continued to be lived out among his followers. But no one really believes he was physically resurrected. That's just a myth. Well, here's the problem with that. The problem with that theory is simply that nobody dies for a myth, right? Nobody dies for a myth. Yet almost all of Jesus' disciples and subsequent generations of Christians, as you know, were persecuted and martyred for their faith. You see, if someone threatens to execute you because of your belief in the resurrection, and if you know it's a myth, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to say, wait, hang on a minute, I, I get it, it's just a myth. I don't mean that I believe in a uh, literal resurrection. Don't, please don't kill me. That's what you'd say, right? Yet thousands upon thousands of Christians were willing to die for what they clearly believed was literally true, that Christ had been raised up and was still present among them. That's the first one. Second one, even more popular, is called the hallucination theory. Uh, this is the alternative explanation that, as the name suggests, says that the disciples were simply hallucinating, simply imagining that they saw the risen Christ. Now that might seem plausible, but the problem is simply the amount of people who claim to have the same experience. And any psychiatrist will tell you today, for that many people, all to have the exact same hallucination simply does not happen. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we have the text here, he says, for I handed on to you as a first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And check this part out. That he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. He says, most of still, are whom alive, though some of them have died. I especially appreciate Paul mentioning here that some of the witnesses who claim to have seen Christ are in fact still alive. In other words, what he's saying is, I'm not trying to hide anything, guys. If you don't believe me, you can go and ask those people directly and they'll tell you. Now, the next one is, I think, the most amusing. Let's see what you think of argument number three. This one is called the swoon theory. Swoon kind of means, you know, to pass out, to faint, something like that. And so the argument simply is that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross in the first place. For, for whatever reason, they say, Jesus was drugged. He, he fainted and he simply appeared to be dead. Now, I can tell you that's extremely unlikely simply for the fact that the Romans were absolute experts at killing people, okay? Uh, and actual fact, if you were a Roman executioner and your job was to execute someone, if you failed to carry out your task, you yourself 
was subject to capital punishment. So in other words, as a Roman uh, soldier given the task of crucifying someone, you made sure that you got the job done. And as you know as well, and even uh, Alma was mentioning this in the children's story earlier, the Bible tells us that blood and water uh, both came out from Jesus' side, which we know now uh, through our, uh, our modern medicine is known as uh, the pericardial effusion. It's the release of water buildup around the membrane of the heart. So Jesus was pierced in his lungs, in his heart, and he died, and therefore that's the reason why the blood and water came out. And I think finally, for, for number three, uh, another reason why this swoon theory fails completely is that, think about it, if it was just a half-drugged, drowsy Jesus that comes staggering out of the tomb, that's hardly going to make anyone exclaim, this is the resurrected Lord. You're just going to say, Jesus, you've, you know, you've been on drugs, it's time to wake up, you know? Now, the last argument questions the reliability of the resurrection stories in the first place. Uh, people say, and, you know, it's a fair question, people ask, well, how do we know that the New Testament documents aren't just inventions? How do we know they're not just made-up stories? Well, fair question, but I can tell you that any serious historian will tell you that the New Testament texts are the best attested documents in the whole of the ancient world, simply because they, um, they, they fulfill two criteria, those being that we have lots of them and they date extremely early. So in fact, the New Testament documents are more historically reliable than any other texts that we all accept as fact. So if we want to simply dismiss the New Testament as made up, then that means we have to throw away almost everything we know about the ancient world. And remember too, and I'm sure you've heard this, that in these days, uh, the testimony of women was considered extremely unreliable. No one took the witness of a woman seriously. And as you know, the gospel writers uh, use women as the principal witnesses of the empty tomb. So that would be a very, very strange, bizarre thing to include in your story if you were trying to persuade someone of, of something. So all these arguments, I think, end up just making me feel like it's easier just to admit, after all, that what the Bible says happened actually did happen. You can make your own minds up. Now, do all these arguments prove 100% conclusively that the resurrection of Jesus took place. No, of course they don't. And that's obviously where our faith has to come in. But my point here is simply that you are not stupid and you are not anti-intellectual if you believe in the resurrection. And you actually have a lot of good historical evidence to back you up. Now, however, despite everything I've said so far, this is the important thing. You don't want to make Jesus' resurrection simply a matter of intellectual assent. Does that make sense? It's not just about agreeing with a fact. Believing in the resurrection is a self-involving claim that changes the way you see the world and it changes who you pay allegiance to. See, when doubting Thomas touches Jesus' body, he doesn't say, oh wow, God can raise people from the dead. What does Thomas say? He says, my Lord and my Savior. It is no exaggeration to say that the resurrection of Jesus is the most important event in the history of the world. It's the pivotal moment where God acts decisively on behalf of humanity, destroying death and conquering sin once and for all. We have all been redeemed and reconciled to God, and through the gift of the Holy Spirit, we share in Christ's life and exist in God's new world. <laughs> 
But of course, the danger in thinking about the resurrection is that we can become rather selfish. We can get rather preoccupied with connecting the resurrection of Christ simply to everything about my own individual salvation. We say that Jesus rose from the dead so that I can have eternal life. I have been forgiven from all my sins and now I get to be in heaven for all eternity. Well, that's fine and that's, there's obviously some truth to that. That is not quite how the Bible talks about things. You see, salvation in scripture, salvation is always a communal act. It's always something that takes place in the context of a much wider community. In the Old Testament, God chooses to enter into a covenant with Israel as a nation. In the New Testament, that promise then gets extended into the Gentile world and later to the entire earth. And Christianity is still spreading its message of salvation to all people. Salvation is more than saving individual souls. It's more accurate to say that salvation is God shaping a people for himself. When we think of our resurrection in terms of Jesus, you know, sometimes we think of Jesus just returning to the earth like some spaceman and scooting us off to another planet called heaven. When we think like that, we grossly misunderstand what the Bible is trying to say. See, the Bible's vision of resurrection is not of the earth being annihilated and humanity being taken to someplace else. It is rather of our earth being transformed by the kingdom of God. You see, the new Jerusalem comes here and not the other way around. In Revelation, it says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. How beautifully the revelator depicts our final destination as this marriage between heaven and earth. See, it isn't that God's kingdom and our earth are two separate locations, one here and one there. No, heaven is simply earth with God fully present. God's heaven will wed itself to our earth and completely transform it. That's exactly why we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now in fact, Paul's theology of the resurrection was so all-encompassing that he talked about it not simply as renewing humanity, but renewing all of creation. Hence the name of the, uh, sermons, uh, the, the, the sermon today. He says, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. For Paul, the resurrection gives rise to a future hope for the whole world where death and decay will be done away with and where a new creation takes place. God doesn't simply wipe the slate clean and start all over again, because to do that wouldn't be to destroy death at all. God abolishes death forever, rescuing everything from its current state of corruption. What God did for Jesus at Easter, he will do not only for those who are in Christ, but for the entire cosmos. So what do we do in the meantime? Do we simply wait? Wait until we get our new resurrected bodies? No. Our job is to lean into this new creation and work alongside God 
in building his kingdom. Remember, resurrection does not mean starting from scratch. It means fixing what is broken, repairing what is damaged, liberating what is enslaved. So just to shrug our shoulders and say, ah, the world is too much of a mess for anything to be done about it. That is precisely not to believe in the resurrection. Precisely because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, we know that God's new world has already broken into the present. And now Christian mission becomes all the more urgent and meaningful. Our last text for today from Paul. He says, therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, be immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, what we do now makes a real difference, especially because it has eternal consequences. So I ask you again, do you believe in the resurrection? And I'm going to answer the question for you. Sometimes you believe in the resurrection, and sometimes you don't. You believe in the resurrection when you choose to forgive the unforgivable. You believe in the resurrection when you pray for the people you hate the most. You believe in the resurrection when you put your own agenda on hold and allow yourself to be interrupted by the person who irritates you more than anybody else. You believe in the resurrection when you wake up and you say to yourself, how am I going to embody the love of Christ in my life today, in all of my interactions? You believe in the resurrection when you stop, smile, talk to the stranger on the street. You believe in the resurrection when you take care of the planet and use its resources responsibly. You believe in the resurrection when you fight against injustice and violence and racism. You believe in the resurrection when you feed the hungry, visit the imprisoned, comfort the sick and clothe the naked. In the resurrection of Christ, we see the first fruit of God's new creation. We see that pain, death, sin are done away with and all things are renewed. Our mission is to help to simply lift the veil between those two kingdoms, heaven and earth, and to show that actually they really aren't that far apart. This Easter, may we believe in the resurrection and work together to bring heaven into the here and now and to let God's love burst into the world. If that is your belief, and I'm sure that it is, would you stand with me now and let's sing with energy and with confidence our closing hymn, Because He Lives.